AP Calculus BC Unit A Day 7 lesson. Um, first, we have warm up. So you should be getting pretty good at these. Go ahead and pause the video and try this out. Okay, assuming that you guys have tried this express in closed form. So here's a series. You try and figure out what's going on here. Um, uh, it says that we've got to start with n equals 1. So we're going to do n equals 1 to infinity. So n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4. So it looks like it's 2 times n, 2 times n, 2 times n on the top. On the bottom, it looks like it's 5 to the n plus 1, 5 to the n plus 1. And then there is an alternating pattern here, so you don't want to miss that. So it's going to be negative 1 to the n plus 1 or minus 1, and then 2n on top, and then 5 to the n plus 1 on the bottom. This is not a geometric series, okay? All right, um, next one, find the value of this infinite series. If possible, the value is the sum, right? And uh, so if it's a geometric series, then it'll be a over 1 minus r. So this is your a value, obviously. Uh, r is, are we multiplying by the same thing? Uh, 2 thirds, 2 thirds, 2 thirds. So it's, it's negative 2 thirds. So is the absolute value of r less than 1? Yes. So it converges. So we can find the sum using the formula. So you got to, you got to, and this is a geometric series, by the way. This, this formula only applies to geometric series. Uh, so the sum equals 8 over 1 minus negative 2 thirds. So that's 8 over 5 thirds. So that's 8 times 3 fifths. So that's 24 fifths. Okay, next one. Um, Looks like it could be a geometric series, but you might want to like, now realize that we start at n equals two. That affects the first term. But if we if we split this up, like this, the same thing as three times three to the n. I think that helps to figure out what the r value is without having to write the open form. So there's a two in front and then a two thirds to the n power. So this is geometric, You're able to make it fit that <clears throat> form. Um, the a term, though, is is what you get when you plug in equals 2 in. So that's going to be 4 ninths times 2 is 8 ninths. Don't plug 0 in here and say, oh, it's 2. No, if it started in equals 0, then that's right. The r value doesn't really matter what you start with. It's, uh, it's 2 thirds. Is the R value less than one? Yes, it converges. <clears throat> so the sum is A over one minus R. So eight ninths over one third. So eight over nine times three over one. So eight thirds. Okay, uh, write a power series of the given order and find the interval of convergence. So if it's written like this, this is kind of, you know, we want to make, we want to think of it as S equals A over 1 minus R. So we think of this as 1 over 1 minus something. Well, it'd have to be negative 2X. So that's going to be your R value. So um, your first term, this is your A, and then your R equals negative 2X. So the first term is 1, and then you multiply by the R value, and then you multiply by the R value again. We want to go order 4. That's not four terms. That's the highest power, and the last term is fourth power. So multiply by negative 2X again. You get 8X cubed plus 16X to the fourth. And that is the series. Unless you really like, you take, like taking nasty derivatives over and over again, then you could do it that way. But this is a way that if you get something that looks like it's written in the form of the sum of A over 1 of R, then you can, you can do that. Now, the interval of convergence is the absolute value of R 
has to be less than one. So we could divide a two out um, and then you really don't need the negative the absolute value of x and then the absolute value of negative x are the same thing. So we get this and uh, I like to use that rule of postulate and say, okay, this distance from zero has to be less than one half. So we're at negative one half to positive one half and it's this right here. So the interval of convergence is negative one half to positive one half. Parentheses, because we don't include the ends, if we did, it would be brackets. <clears throat> okay, next one. Um, now, natural log, if you remember, the trick we used is we integrated this. So you say, well, what would I integrate to get that? Because this is kind of a basic series. Um, <clears throat> I guess technically we should put t's in here and then the x is in the uh, limit. The This has the first term is 1 and the r value is t, so it's going to be plus t plus t squared plus t cubed plus dot dot dot. And so if we integrate this, we get a uh, natural log of 1 minus t and there's an extra negative. Be careful and then the limits are zero to x. And over here, we get uh, t plus t squared over two plus t cubed over three plus t the fourth over four, right? From zero to x. Um, so we plug x in. Now there's a negative here, so we're gonna wanna move that to the other side because we're trying to get natural log of one minus x. So you plug x in, you plug zero and natural log of one is zero, that goes away. You move the negative to the other side, so now it's going to be negative. You plug x in negative x minus x squared over 2 minus x cubed over 3 uh, minus x to the 4th over 4. It said 5th order, so minus x to the 5th over 5. Um, that is the, that's the power series, 5th order. Uh, the interval of convergence, absolute value of R has, is going to be the absolute value of um, X has to be less than 1. So that's going to give you negative 1 to 1. <clears throat> but uh, it does work on the edges, except for if you get natural log of 0, with it, which is undefined. So if we plug 1 in, that's not going to work. But this other edge will work if you plug negative 1 in. So that's the interval of convergence. Um, I mean, at first it's uh, you know negative one to one, but this is a special case. So that's the uh, warm up. Now today we're going to talk about error. We're using these things to estimate things, and, and we kind of want to know how good or bad our answers are, and potentially we want to be able to decide what error we want and use that to determine how many terms we should take. Now the error in a geometric series, find the exact value of the error, exact value of the error of a given truncated geometric series. So that means we cut it off. If it is truncated after the first four non-zero terms, it's different than fourth order. So that would be this, first four non-zero terms, and we truncate it, we cut it off. The error is gonna be everything after that that would have made it exact right so what that is in this case that's just a geometric series itself with uh you know an a value of 16 over 81 and an r value of the same r value here which looks like it's two thirds and as long as it as it as long as it converges which it does then we can find the sum of the remaining series. Any series is also made up of other subseries. The sum equals a over one minus r. And 16 over 27. <clears throat> This is the error. This is the exact error. Um, so right here, the error is its own geometric series. 
Now it's usually not going to be this easy, but there's an easy one. Okay. Um, we can maybe use our calculator to kind of like, you know, it says uh, error in a power series. Use a calculator to find three significant figure value for the error in this truncated power series. Okay. So um, it says this is the function. It's centered at this. So that's a McLaurin series, right? A series truncated at the first four non-zero terms. And we're going to estimate cosine of 0.2. So let's write the series first. We have cosine memorized. It's all the even terms, starting with 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the 4th over 4 factorial minus x to the 6th over 6 factorial. And then it keeps going, but we're going to take the first four non-zero terms. You see non-zero because there's terms in between here that go away, right? That have zero coefficients. Um, and so then we're going to plug in cosine of 0.2. And the approximation of it is to use this or whatever, 0.2 squared over 2 factorial plus 0.2 to the fourth over 4 factorial minus 0.2 to the sixth over 6 factorial. And, uh, you know, let's see what this gives us. So, um, now, you can do factorials on your calculator, by the way, if you really feel feel like it's necessary. I think it's easier if you just can do them, some of them. You had to, that's 2 times 3 is 6 times 4 is 24 times 5 is 120 times 6 is 7. 20? I mean, to me, that's easier than trying to find the buttons in the calculator, but I'll show you how to do it in your calculator, too. So 1 minus 0.2 squared divided by 2 sorry, 0.2 squared divided by 2 plus 0.2 to the fourth divided by, now 4 factorial, what you would do is you do 4, and I think it's under the math menu. Let me see where I find it. And then it's under the PRB menu, probability, and there it is, factorial. Um, Minus 0.2 to the 6 divided by, you could do it, 6 math PRB factorial. And so this is the value we get. This is the estimate. Uh, 0 0.980066577 uh, The exact value on a calculator, cosine of 0.2 in radian mode, is that. I mean, it's really close. In fact, they look identical. Right? On my calculator, I get the same thing, 0 0.980066577. But your calculator does store more accuracy than that um, in it. And that's all it displays. So what we want to do is we want to do cosine of 0.2 minus this and see what the difference is. I don't think it's going to be 0. Um, it might not be very big, but so I'm going to go back and say, um, well, no, what I'm going to do, let's see, I'm going to say cosine of point 0.2 minus parentheses previous, not, now I'm just, Okay, I'm going to do that. Second insert, cosine of 0.2 minus parentheses. Close parentheses. And I get 6.346E negative 11. What that, that, what that is, is that scientific notation. And so that's uh, 6.346 times 10 to the negative 11th. So three significant digits, I would say 6.35. Now, for, for error, um, you definitely want to round up. We're trying to decide what the error is under. And so you definitely, I don't think you want to truncate um, you don't want to round down for sure. So in general with error, when we're trying to estimate error, we want to go on the, the worst case uh, side. So that's
that's that. Now let's get into what we're really usually going to do, because usually we're not going to be able to just use a calculator and find the difference or whatever. So this is really what we're usually going to do. And this is a bit more complicated. And I've made a separate video attempting to go through the proof of the formulas I'm going to show you. But in the end, you don't need to know the proof or understand the proof, but um, you got to be able to use these. But um, just in case it bugs you and, and you want to feel more comfortable about it. But in the end, this is you're just going to have to you know, memorize this. So Taylor's theorem, I'm talking about Taylor series, right? So it's a mathematician. Taylor theorem for the remainder. If F has derivatives of all orders in an open interval I containing A, then e for each positive integer N for each X and I. So this is this is the formula for a Taylor series, right? But here's the thing is they're saying that there's this extra part at the end and they call it the remainder, okay? And so it's sort of like all the other uh, rest of the terms or also what we've been talking about, you could think of as like the error. So this is the formula that Taylor came up with, or this is the Lagrange form of it. So Lagrange came up with this. And the interesting thing is it looks like this remainder is all the rest of the terms. And this formula really just looks like, looks like, looks like just the next term, not all of them. It looks like the next term. After the nth derivative, nth power, n factorial, n plus one derivative, n plus one power, n plus one factorial. The only thing is this C right here, okay? So this is this formula for the remainder. And C is said to be somewhere between A and X. So this is sort of a formula for the error, for the exact error and uh, it should work if you know the right value of C between the center and the value of X that you're evaluating it at, that you're using it to estimate. Okay? But that's the problem. We don't know what that C is. Now, it's proven, if you look in this other video, we kind of try and go through it as effectively as possible, that the remainder goes to zero as n goes to infinity as we keep taking more and more terms and we take in infinite terms, the remainder, the error should go to zero for this Taylor series to actually equal the functions that we're using it for. And that can be proven. Okay. And so that's, that's part of what we're using here. Now the error kind of goes back to this remainder theorem and it says, this is a Lagrange error bound. It says that the error has to be less than this error bound. Okay. And the error bound isn't the exact error anymore. They're saying it's for some C between A and X. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the worst case scenario. We're going to find the A, the, the value of C. We're going to find the value of C that makes Fn plus 1 C the biggest, positive or negative. Okay? We're going to find, essentially we're going to find the absolute max of the n plus 1 derivative, absolute max or min, between x and a, and it's at some value c. Okay? So, <clears throat> um, so c is between because we're using these to evaluate values that are between the center and the value of x, the value you are evaluating for, that you're using it for, okay? So I'm gonna show you guys a couple examples here. Um, and so it says truncate the McLaurin series after the first three non-zero terms and find the, grand, the Lagrange error bound for x equals 2. So uh, here's the deal. We don't actually have to write the whole series out. Um, we just are trying to find this. Now, if we want the first three non-zero terms, um, we want the next one after that. 
the, the very next one. So it's kind of like we're doing work as if we're going to find, and it's it's centered around, uh, yeah, it's McLaurin series, so it's centered at x equals zero. Um, but we need to find that derivative. This is a derivative here. So it's not good enough to use the memorized forms of the McLaurin series for this. But it's kind of like we're going to construct it. We're going to say, okay, well, this is the original function. Uh, this is the first derivative. It's going to be 3 cosine 3x. And this is the second derivative. It's going to be negative 9 sine 3x. And this is the next derivative. It's going to be negative 27 cosine 3x. And at some point, you might want to sort of evaluate your progress. Um, so then you're going to plug 0 in because it's McLaurin. Okay, don't plug x equals 2 in. That comes in later. So that's going to be 0. Um, that's going to be 3. That's going to be 0. Um, that's going to be negative 27. That's going to be zero. So we want the first three non-zero terms. So we have two of them. So we got to keep going. The fifth derivative is going to be 243 cosine 3x. And that gives you uh, 243, your third non-zero term. Okay. I'm not going to actually find the terms, but I need to know where I'm at. Now, I just take the next derivative. Now, by the way, at some point when we start putting too many of these prime marks, we just start writing the derivative in superscript uh, parentheses. So the next derivative is negative, uh, if you multiply this by 3, 600, 729 sine 3x. Now, even though this gives you a 0, and that term isn't there, we don't care. This is what we want. This is the third non-zero term. The Lagrange error bound is used, uses the very next derivative, okay? So you gotta get used to writing this down. Now, the good thing about this is it's easy to remember because it is, it's just the next derivative. It's the n plus one. So right here, we are at the fifth. So we want the sixth derivative at some c value. The x value is two. The center is at zero. And since we're at the sixth derivative here, we're at the sixth power here over six factorial. So we gotta get good at setting it up. <clears throat> now, here's the deal. This is, this is the part where we gotta think. We gotta say, okay, what's the worst value of this? Okay, and so essentially, <clears throat> we gotta do extreme value theorem on this guy. We gotta do EVT. Uh, the endpoints are going to be 0 and 2. So we have the endpoints. Um, you got to find critical points. You technically have to do table stuff. I'm going to be okay with us being kind of lazy about this. A lot of times these functions are really basic functions. This is a sine curve that is upside down. Okay. Looks like this. It goes all the way down to negative 729 goes all the way up to positive 729. The period is usually 2 pi, but it's being divided by 3, right? So that's about, like, uh, pi is about 3. So that's about 2, a little more than 2. So this is about 1, okay? <clears throat> and we're looking for values of x between 0 and 2. Well, that would definitely be all of this portion of the curve up until almost the end okay but that's gonna be this portion of the curve and then you can just look at this curve and you can tell me what's the worst positive or negative value biggest positive or negative value and you'd say oh it's 729 because you're hitting it you're hitting it right there but we can't always just do that but you know you got to look at what portion sometimes the portion of the curve is just this and you never get to the amplitude of that curve but in this case it is 729 is the worst value times 2 to the 6th over 6 factorial. I'm going to go ahead and use my calculator to calculate this. So um, I'm going to say 729 times 2 to the 6th 
divided by, and we could do the factorial thing, math, PRB, factorial, and I get 64.8. This is your Lagrange error bound. So this isn't the error. This is the worst case error. It might be this bad. It's likely that it's not that bad. Okay. So we found the value of C between 0 and 2. I mean, it's right here and it's right here. There's actually two values there that are bad. Okay, let's do another one. Taylor polynomial, fourth order, centered at x equals 0 uh, to approximate cosine of 2, find the Granger bound. So we're doing it for this function right here. So I'm going to crank these out real quick. This is the original function, uh, derivative. Uh, it's going to be negative 2 sine 2x. Now, this one's a little different. They didn't tell us the value of x, which I'm going to point out is potentially confusing. So I want to make sure you guys don't make that mistake. Well, let's crank out all these derivatives. They're pretty easy to do. Um, uh, this time it's fourth order. So that's kind of different too. That's not four non-zero terms, that's fourth order. So that means we're definitely going up to the fourth derivative uh, for these, and then the fifth derivative is what we're gonna definitely want, the fifth derivative for sure. I don't even have, I, I know for sure. Now you wanna get all these derivatives right so you get this last one. Um, positive eight sine two x, uh, 16 cosine two x, uh, negative 32 sine 2x. So this is the derivative that we're going to be using. So for the Lagrange error bound, I mean, if it helps, you can start just writing down the formula. It's the n plus 1 derivative at some value c, x minus the center a to the n plus 1 power over n plus 1 factorial. I mean, this is, this is that pattern we're using all the time, right? Now for us, we know it's going to be the fifth derivative at some c value. Uh, we're evaluating it now. A, this is the a value. Be careful. It says centered at x equals 0. That's the a value. The x value is not 2, okay, because this is the formula. What, what would you have to plug in for x to get 2? You would plug x equals 1 in, so you got to be careful with that. Last time they just told us the x. So the x value is 1. The center is 0 to the fifth power over 5 factorial, okay? This is the part that's kind of iffy. Well, what's the worst case value of that? Well, we could draw a quick sketch, and um, this is a sine curve, again, upside down, right? Goes all the way down negative 32 up to positive 32. <clears throat> this is the lazy way, by the way. I have to have a picture. Otherwise, you've got to do full-blown EVT, which I don't think you want to do. Now, the period is usually 2 pi. That's being divided by 2, so it's just pi, which is about 3.14. So this is at pi over 2. We're interested in the values of C need to be between the center and the value of X that we're evaluating. So it goes up to 1. So this is, what, 1.57. Um, so this right here would be at pi over 4, which would be like, 0.785. So luckily for us, 1 is like right about here. So this is the portion of the curve that we're doing EVT on. Does it capture that worst case amplitude? Otherwise, if it were to stop right here, I'd say, well, what is the value right there? Because that's our worst case value. So for this problem, it does turn out to be 32 over 5 factorial. Um, on my calculator, I could do this real quick. Uh, 35 divided by 5 <clears throat> factorial. And I get 0 0.291666 repeating, it looks like. Okay. So our Lagrange error bound um, is going to be 0. Point, oh, did I do that wrong? 
Oh, I did. I did 35. Should be 32. So I don't know what happened there. 0 0.26666 repeating. So we're going to say 0 0.267. And like I said, for the error bound, the worst case error, you should never truncate or round down, ever. You should, you should always round up for your last digit because it's the worst case. If you truncate, you're saying this is the worst case. It's not the worst case anymore. Your error could be worse. So um, that's how you do it. Um, your best bet is to try this today as it's fresh in your head. Try the assignment. It's a worksheet, which you should be happy about also, that it's not a book assignment. And uh, try it out and uh, see what you can do. Also, you can watch the other video I've created that helps show the background proof of the formulas that we're using. Otherwise, we're just going to be using them.